Welcome everyone to Geopolitical Intelligence Services uh, webinar on accelerated change in Sub-Saharan Africa and the outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa in 2021. Uh, my name is Andy Kurth. I'm a senior editor at GIS. I'll be your host today. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to thank our, uh, our panelists here uh, to talk with us. That is uh, Teresa Pinto. Uh, she is the GIS African Affairs expert, and she is a PhD candidate at the global, uh, in global studies at the Nova University in Lisbon. Uh, Teresa, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, I do want to also introduce our founder and chairman, Prince Michael Liechtenstein, who is the uh, initiator of this project. Prince Michael. Um, thank you, Andy, and welcome, everybody. Um, we uh, want to welcome you at this webinar on Africa. Africa is a very important uh, continent, a continent of the future, a continent where, where, where a lot is happening, and a continent which is not very well known for, for many. So as our vocation is to give insights and also give informations which are practically relevant and basis for decision, we decided to start our series of webinars on Africa. And we are very grateful to the audience to be here. We are especially uh, grateful to Andy, who is moderating it, but also to, uh, Teresa Pinto, who is a great expert on that. So I wish everybody a good webinar and thank you so much and have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you very much for that, Prince Michael. Uh, indeed, Africa is one of the less well understood continents uh, by us in the West, certainly. Um, and it's not a continent, it's not a place that people often think of when they think of um, geopolitics. They think of China, they think of Russia, they think of the United States, they think of that kind of three-way Europe, that three or four-way global power play when they think of geopolitics. And yet Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, is crucial to that power play. Uh, and we're going to get into that today. Uh, three points I want to make before we get started is that China is focusing a lot of its attention on Africa. So it must be worth something very important for China to be devoting as much attention as it is there. Uh, China, uh, sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa can have a huge, huge impact on Europe as we saw in 2015 with the migrant crisis, uh, among other things. And uh, Africa has the world's youngest population. Um, it could leapfrog several development stages um, and you know, it has an enormous economic potential from that point of view. Um, so with that in mind, before we get started, I do want to let our audience know that they can uh, participate today. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom, you can see a Q&A um, and you can write questions in there. I will try and look at them and perhaps get to them, um, uh, pose them to, to our expert today. Uh, if I have an opportunity. We have a lot to get through. And then at the end, for the last 15 minutes or so, I will open it up to questions from our audience where you can ask the questions personally. On your Zoom console, you should have uh, the ability, you should see the ability to raise your hand. At the end of the webinar, I'll let you know uh, when, when you should have that opportunity to raise your hand digitally, and I'll call on you and you can ask Teresa a question in the last 15 minutes. So, uh, with that housekeeping out of the way, and uh, with our stage set for Africa, I would like to pose the first question that I have uh, to Teresa. And, and I'm, this comes with a little bit of background as well. COVID-19 is still the big geopolitical issue of the moment. It, it informs all of the geopolitical moves that are happening by, by any actor on the, on the world stage at the moment. Um, it's affected Europe and the United States severely. Um, Europe with a population of 450 million people uh, has had 28.5 million cases and 645,000 deaths. The United States with 330 million people has had 
32 million cases and 50, uh, sorry, 569,000 deaths. So big numbers. Africa, with a much larger population, more than two or three times, four times the United States population, Africa as a whole, 1.2 billion people, has only had 4.5 million cases. So yeah, less than eight times what, what we've had in, in, in the United States. Uh, and uh, only 119,000 deaths. Teresa, what's going on here? How do we explain this? Why, why has COVID affected Africa so, so lightly in comparison with, with the United States, Europe, other parts of the world? Well, in fact, uh, it's true if, you, if we consider that Africa accounts for around 16% of the world population and only 3.2% of the global COVID-19 cases. And I think what explains these numbers is a combination of factors. First and foremost, as you mentioned, it has to do with demography. We're talking about a very, very young continent where 40% of the population is 15 years old or under and where the average age is 20 years old. If we compare, for example, with the case of Italy, where the average age is 47, it's quite a big difference. And this does not tell us much about the number of cases, but it does suggest that probably those cases will be less severe and most of them asymptomatic. And the second aspect, which I think it's connected to, the, to this first one, has to do with the disease burden. And although this is slowly changing and the region is going through a, an epidemiological transition, what we have now, when compared, for example, with Europe or North America or South America, is a much lower incidence of uh, chronic diseases and conditions such as heart and lung disease, diabetes, obesity. And of course, again, this does not tell us much about the number of cases, but it does suggest that they are pr probably less severe. A third aspect, which I think is also uh, relevant, has to do with the importation risk especially if we consider those landlocked countries in sub-Saharan Africa and those countries that where a substantial part of the population lives in rural areas and in areas that are much less connected to the rest of the world. And so this means, it does not mean that the virus didn't get there, it means that the process was probably slower and so it mitigates the effects. Um, and I also think what we're seeing is uh, the effect of lower testing capacity because we know that in many countries, such capacity is restricted to the main cities and possibly also of incomplete death registration systems in some countries. And so it makes it more difficult to have reliable information about the number of people that died and why did they die? So I would say it's a combination of factors. So it's a, yeah, it's a combination of a younger, healthier population, less connectivity, especially in those landlocked countries and kind of lower testing, uh, and reporting, right? Yes. Um, you said that Africa is going through an epidemiological transition. What did you mean by that? Well, because we're seeing that is perhaps more visible in countries like South Africa, but also in big cities in Nigeria, for example, we're seeing that there are important changes with urbanization, with changes in um, lifestyle lifestyle patterns, uh, we're seeing a change of habits that contributes to um, a higher incidence of chronic diseases as we see in other regions in the world. But that is a very slow process and it's not happening at the same uh, rhythm everywhere in Africa. You mentioned South Africa and South Africa, when I think of it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think of it as one of the more developed countries, one of the more, I don't know, closer to our Western kind of concept of, 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 of statehood, right, and, and society. Um, uh, and there, the pandemic has actually been worse, right? It's also much, much more connected to the rest of the world, isn't it? Yes, yes. I think it has to do with, with all these factors. Uh, it's uh, ahead in terms of the epidemiological transition where we see more cases of diabetes, of chronic disease. It has a much higher testing capacity and cities like Joburg or Cape Town are much more connected to the rest of the world than when we think about cities in landlocked sub-Saharan Africa. Right, right. Okay, well, uh, I suppose you, you've got a young, healthy, less affected by COVID uh, population. 
then I would expect that um, the effects on the economy would also be uh, lighter. Um, yeah, is that the case? Well, I, I would say it's too soon to tell, but definitely Africa was not an exception when it comes to the economic and very negative consequences of COVID-19. And what is interesting is that if you see the particular ways in which African economies were affected, you understand uh, the, the structure of those economies. Because we saw last year that even before the first COVID-19 cases were registered in the continent, we had already economies like Angola, Zambia, Nigeria, that were being severely affected by the pandemics. And why? What we see here, it's the high dependency on exporting commodities and in particular on exporting commodities to China. And China, as we know, was the epicenter of the pandemics and there was this right. sudden and very deep um, uh, decrease in the demand for raw materials. And so these economies were severely affected. But we, another very negative aspect, we, we also saw that has to do with remittances, which have become a key source of revenue, of, uh, of revenue for households and economies across the region. And of course, because of the pandemics, migrant workers in other African countries and in the rest of the world were not able to save and send the same amounts of money. And that also had a big impact. And we're also talking about economies where the informal sector is crucial, is crucial in terms of jobs and in terms of livelihoods. And so lockdowns, and although lockdowns in Africa tended to be less severe and shorter, they had a, a, a more, well, a very negative effect as everywhere in the world, but a more immediate effect. And mm -hmm. why? Because these, the informal sector relies on face-to-face -face interactions. And if people are told that they cannot go to work, they cannot go to the market and sell whatever they have to sell there, uh, they may not be able to feed themselves and their families in the near future. And unlike what we see, for example, in Europe, governments in Africa cannot just throw money at the economic consequences of lockdowns in order to mitigate short-term effects. Um, and this leads us to what I think it's the main problem that has to do with the debt burden. And Before you get started on that, yeah, let me, let me, let me ask uh, that we put up uh, the first image, image number one. Thanks, and go ahead, Teresa, now that we can see what's going on with debt on the continent. So this was something that was already there before the pandemics, and we already had around 40% of the African economies either in a situation of debt distress or at debt distress. But of course, with all the spending pressure connected with the uh, measures to contain COVID, uh, this became much more prominent. Uh, and we had initiatives by the IMF, by the G20 to suspend debt repayments, Right. But this is a sort of double-edged sword because, as we saw in the case of Zambia that defaulted last year, uh, while it may bring some short-term relief, it may further deteriorate the position of these countries and their ability to finance themselves. And yeah, no. How how does how does that happen? So so they they receive debt relief and then they just go and they and they spend the money just right right away or the. Uh, or the debt is, they're unable to pay the debt that, that has been put off then later on, or how does that work? Uh, well, the problem right now is that even in, in even the negotiating such processes of debt relief, it's much more complicated mm. uh, because we're talking about a very heterogeneous group of creditors. So we're talking about bilateral and multilateral debt. We're talking about commercial lenders. And we're talking about an overexposed China. China is overexposed to the African debt. Right. Uh, and we're seeing uh, a, a, relevant, a significant number of countries in a very difficult situation, Zambia, Angola, Mozambique, Ghana. And I do believe that this is something that will remain a structural problem in the future, even because it's very difficult to find a sustainable way out and to, ne to negotiate a way out of, of this debt burden. Yes, as we can see, I just want to uh, point our audience to this um, uh, to this graphic we have here. As they can see, several uh, countries on the continent even have a greater than seventy five percent of GDP debt burden. Another thing that I want to point to, and a couple of things that you that you mentioned, Teresa, you you talked about bilateral debt, multilateral debt, 
and then private creditors, which we have here. Now, uh, as I can see from this, and this only, this our, our data here only goes up to 2016, but I know that the, uh, the debt to private creditors has been increasing, hasn't it? Yes. Can you explain that dynamic, what those are and what's going on and why debt, why it's problematic that debt to private creditors is increasing? Well, it's problematic because you cannot just uh, force those uh, lenders into what is uh, a more political solution for the problem that would be uh, the solution of debt relief. And there's uh, a lot of talk about that now. But obviously, if we're talking about a more heterogeneous group of creditors involving a lot of private and commercial lenders, um, it becomes much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you for that. So, so we've got heavily indebted countries, um, many of whom are heavily connected to the global economy and who were hard hit economically because the global economy slowed down so hard during the pandemic. And that leads me to my next question about instability in Sub-Saharan Africa. There, it's kind of two terms that go, that go hand in hand. When we think of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, many of us, at least in the West, think of instability. We're often hearing about insurgency rebellions um, throughout that part of the continent. Um, did the pandemic affect stability in Sub-Saharan Africa? If so, why? And, and where do we stand now? Well, I would say that uh, the pandemic acted as an accelerator of tensions and grievances that were already there. And I would say that now the situation is quite critical because we have um, three main sources of instability uh, and, and, and the future is quite uncertain. A, a first source has to do with political, social and economic discontent. And this has been aggravated by the pandemics uh, because of a worrying trend we're seeing throughout the region that is rising food prices. And we know that rising food prices have been a main trigger of uprisings and protests uh, over the past decades. And here we can think about what's going on in countries like Angola, Nigeria, Senegal, we may have such situation in South Africa, for example, and we're seeing uh, an increase in the number and intensity of protests. And this is mainly connected to social and economic grievances, but also political in regimes that are not authoritarian, but at the same time, we cannot say that they're full-fledged democracies and where are, there are these tensions and the very young population urbanized. And another worrying indicator has to do with youth unemployment. In Angola, for example, last year, the youth unemployment rate was over 50%. So I do believe that this will remain a main source of instability. A second source of instability has to do with what, what is going on in some countries that play a, a key role in terms of regional security and stability. Uh, and we have the case of Ethiopia uh, and also the case of Chad. And in the case of Ethiopia, and it's important to, to note that Ethiopia, it's uh, a, an economic powerhouse, uh, a symbol of the African Renaissance, and has played a key role in regional stabilization in the Horn of Africa. And since Prime Minister Rabi Ahmed came to power, there was this very rapid process of political change and rising tensions between the Prime Minister and his supporters and the Tigrayan People Liberation Front, which has been for decades the dominant group in the Ethiopian politics. And so COVID-19 acted as an accelerator because the prime minister decided to delay elections last year and the Tigray region defied the decision. Um, and so there, was, there were more tensions and we had an armed conflict in November. And the security and humanitarian situation is deteriorating really fast. And we have the intervention of external actors, namely Eritrea and also tensions with Sudan in Sudan, we also have a very fragile situation with an allegiance between the military and civilian groups, but it, that is very fragile. They don't have the same goals nor the same vision. Uh, and so I would say that we should, uh, there will be more instability in the Horn of Africa. And also in Chad with the sudden death of President Idris Deby, um, 
that increases the risk of instability in an already extremely fragile region, which is the Sahel, uh, and where we have several terrorist groups and armed groups and organized crime groups operating. And while Chad was far from being a democracy and President Idris Deby has been in power for three decades and he was about to uh, be reappointed for yet another term, uh, he played a key role in terms of regional security. He was uh, uh, an important ally of France and of other regional powers that were containing these terrorist groups. So I think that we will definitely have uh, a lot of instability uh, in the near future. That's, that's unfortunate to hear, although I think uh, hardly surprising, especially yeah, considering the developments you mentioned both in Ethiopia and of course the recent developments in, in Chad. Uh, I do want to tell our, uh, our attendees that um, I do see their questions in the Q&A section. We've already got a couple of good ones. And I, uh, I have some questions lined up for Teresa that I think I can incorporate some of those into. So please be patient. I'll try and, and, and get to those. And of course, there will be time at the end. So I want to, uh, I want to notify our attendees of that. Um, uh, but speaking of instability, especially in the Sahel um, and, and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa more generally, I, I want to kind of move then to terrorism. Uh, because as you just mentioned, Chad was a, is a key player in keeping terrorism in check in Africa. Now that ISIS has been beaten back, Al-Qaeda has been tamped down somewhat. Um, a lot of these uh, terrorist organizations have moved greater parts of their organizations to Africa. They were already there. Plus, there were already some very active terrorist groups in Africa, uh, like uh, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, uh, the, these groups. So now that, you, you know, what, what is the outlook for terrorism? And did the pandemic have any sort of effect on it? And then, yeah, what, is it, what does it look like now that, that Chad is so unstable? Well, I would say that, um, and we've been seeing that over the past years, Africa has become the front line in the war against terrorism. And now, right now, there are multiple terrorist groups operating in the continent, uh, most of them from an offensive uh, position, which is quite concerning. And we're talking about affiliates of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. We're talking about Boko Haram in northern Nigeria and the Lake Chad region, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, and now more recently, uh, Ansar al in the in Cabo Delgado, in the north of Mozambique. Uh, and what we see is that despite all the regional and international efforts to contain, for example, Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, these groups have maintained their operational capacity, their, their funding capacity, their recruitment capacity. Uh, and what we see now in Mozambique is a situation that is out of control. I, I don't think that COVID-19 um, by creating instability, of course, it favors uh, these groups, but I, I, I do think that this is happening. It, it, it's not directly connected to, to COVID-19. But I would say that there are three impo two important aspects about these groups. And the first one is their capacity uh, to establish allegiances of a variable geometry with other terrorist groups, with organized crime groups, uh, with local actors, uh, and this has helped them, helped them to become more and more resilient. And the second aspect, which I think it's also important, is that it's not, it will not be possible to address this security challenge, because it is a security challenge, without addressing the political roots of the problem. And if we see these regions, what they all have in common is the fact that the state has failed in its most basic duties. So we're talking about regions characterized by chronic poverty, Mm -hmm. chronic insecurity, a sort of Hobbesian state of nature of war of all against all. And while, of course, these groups operate through terror and not by generating consent, the fact is that they're able to present an alternative narrative. So mm -hmm. you have this government, this inefficient government of infidels and corrupts, and here we have an alternative, call it the Caliphate, the Islamic State, the Islamic Courts Union. Uh, and so I do think that the political nature of the problem, it's, it's quite relevant here. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and when you talk about the instability and the, the rising um, influence of these terrorist groups, when we have heard that uh, the economies are still reeling from, from the global impacts of, 
uh, of COVID-19, this leads me to wonder if we're not on the verge of another migration crisis, both within Africa and to Europe, like we saw in something like 2015. Um, I believe migration is greatly down now due to the uh, due to the pandemic restrictions. Do you expect a new flood of, uh, of, of migration this year? And thank you for image two. Uh, as our uh, participants can see, we have some, some of the paths that the migrants took. Well, I think that more waves are coming uh, for two main reasons. First, because we know that uh, since the beginning of times, people migrate. And second, because in the case of um, African migration into Europe, all the push and pull factors remain in place. So as you mentioned, we have now a very atypical situation. Last year, we had the lowest numbers in terms of irregular migration since 2013, with an exception that is those who try to enter Europe through the Canary Islands. And we, we see that that is already having an impact in the political debate and conflict in Spain. But overall, we had this very dramatic decrease in the number uh, in terms of migratory pressure. But the truth is that all the push and pull factors remain. So people, it's not that people are not migrating, but we have a, a very high number of migrants that are stranded because of travel bans, border closures, and all the restrictions imposed by, uh, because of COVID-19. Um, and there's this idea when it comes to the EU strategy to, 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 to deal with migration, there's this idea that if living conditions improve in origin countries, then you will be able to reduce migratory pressure. But that may not be the case because we know that those who migrate are those who are better off within their communities, those who have the resources uh, that are required to pay to to organized, organized crime groups that uh, smuggle migrants in, along very, very dangerous routes. Um, and so probably in contexts that are of poverty or extreme poverty, if living conditions improve, then we will be having more, not less migration. And at the mm -hmm. same time, the EU, because this is a highly controversial issue and there's not a consensus, the EU has not been able to design a consistent narrative and a consistent strategy about migration. So I, I do believe that this is definitely something that will remain a challenge throughout the next decades. And I think there is also another important aspect that has to do with refugees. And in 2015, we, ha we had a refugee crisis that was the, a consequence of a very specific geopolitical situation with conflict in Syria and with disintegration in Libya. And what we know now is that the number of refugees in Africa has been increasing in a very fast way because those who had to flee their country, the, their countries and their, and their homes years or decades ago, most of them remain in refugee camps and they had their children there. And, and so these camps have become a sort of permanent settlement. And at the same time, we have more conflict and more threats to human security. Uh, and so the number is rapidly increasing. And there is this dependency on buffer states, and we can think about Turkey, not, not in relation to Africa, but we can also think about Libya, about Algeria. And this is a very delicate situation. Uh, and I do believe that both African and European leaders uh, should focus more on trying to find a sustainable and an efficient solution for, for this challenge, because um, the number has been dramatically increasing. Indeed. Indeed. Well, um, no discussion of Africa would be complete, geopolitical discussion of Africa would be complete without, without turning to the role of China, which we've already mentioned several times, and which uh, the subject of which is uh, very much uh, taking uh, center stage in our Q&A section as I, as I look through it. Um, so uh, if we could have uh, image three put up, please. Um, we know that uh, you know, Africa plays a very big role in the Belt and Road Initiative, as we can see here uh, in this graphic. We know that China has been going to Africa to extract resources. We know that China has been making a diplomatic effort to get uh, African countries to uh, do things like, uh, like not recognize Taiwan. And it's been, uh, you know, making a lot of economic partnerships in terms of um, building infrastructure, 
and, and, and things like that. Um, so if, if you could tell us a little bit about what China's role has, has looked like kind of up until now, and then what's happening now, and because I know that China's changing its tack toward Africa, right? And, and is that a result of, of the pandemic? And before you answer, I do want to get in what our audience has said. Um, one, uh, Junhua Zhang uh, asks um, what the West can do to compete with China in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we also have uh, a question from Margot Alzano, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name, and uh, who asks, um, has the pandemic accelerated or slowed down the entrenchment of Chinese influence in Sub-Saharan Africa? So what's going on with China now? The pandemic, what's its effect? And then maybe what can the West do to kind of counter that? Uh, so I think we're seeing very interesting and important changes going on when it comes to the relationship between uh, Beijing and African countries. Uh, and I also think that Africa is a privileged position from where to observe China's global ambitions. And it's, it's perhaps uh, useful to go a little bit back in time when more than two decades ago, Beijing started to implement its go out and buy strategy. And that was when China realized that it needed to secure access to raw materials to feed its very accelerated growth. And African countries were key in this strategy. Uh, and a very important um, tool of this strategy was the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. And last year, the, this forum turned 20. And when we see what has been achieved, it is quite impressive. China has built more than 20 ports in Africa, more than 80 large scale power facilities, more than 100 hospitals and medical centers. Uh, the volume trade dramatically increased, the military footprint also. So this is quite impressive. But now we're seeing some changes uh, and for three fundamental reasons. First, because China is transitioning from being an export driven economy to being an economy oriented to domestic consumption. And that is happening in a moment that, according to Beijing, is a moment of slow or slower globalization. And that at the same time, as we know, is critical in terms of the competition for global power. And this leads us to the dual circulation principle, which has been advanced by China, and which says that uh, domestic and foreign markets must interact and complement one another, but priority must be given to the internal circuit. And so this is already impacting the relations between China and Africa. We're seeing a more cautious China when it comes to investments and loans. But of course, these big projects like the, the Belt and Road Initiative will remain in place. And as you said, African countries play a really important role here. But what I think we'll be seeing is more cooperation along the digital Silk Road and the health Silk Road. And this, of course, reflects the fact that first, China is a technological superpower, and that explains also its rising, its global rising. And Beijing wants to become a, a, a global player in healthcare over the next decade. And so here, African countries are expected to play an important role. And I would say that uh, regarding the, the effects of the pandemics, again, I would say that it was more about accelerating there was already a lot of cooperation going on, and this has obviously been accelerated. I think it remains to be seen if China will increase its leverage or not, uh, but they're doing a big effort. And we see, for example, we saw last year a very aggressive mask diplomacy, not only in Africa, throughout the world, with Beijing providing uh, medical equipment, know-how, human resources to those countries struggling with COVID-19. And now what we're seeing is a vaccine diplomacy. And this is quite interesting. For example, the Chinese foreign minister has accused Western countries of vaccine nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, and China is presenting itself as the champion for vaccination in the global South. And in Africa, it has been using the distribution networks that were developed over the last decades now to distribute vaccines. We have, for example, a cold chain air bridge between Shenzhen and Addis Ababa for the distribution of vaccines. Uh, and I think that what this tells us, uh, it, it tells us a lot about China's global ambitions. Uh, 
about soft power, mm -hmm. uh, not only, as you mentioned, about the relevance of African states, we're talking about more than 50 states in multilateral forums, and here China is clearly succeeding because we see its influence in shaping the global agenda, even the way we think and discuss about global problems, uh, but also in terms of presenting China as an alternative, a political and, e and an economic alternative model to what is the, the Western liberal democracy. Uh, and so I do think that a strategy to counter this influence has to be a, a strategy that includes these cultural, political, and economic aspects. I mean, I think all of them are, are, are important. Fascinating, fascinating uh, answer. Um, we do, we now are at the point of the webinar where if people would like to personally ask uh, questions, they can digitally raise their hand and I can try and uh, call on them. Um, but as we're waiting for that, if people are interested, I do have some more questions from uh, the from the chat, which I think are are, are really good. And one of them uh, regards the African Continental Free Trade Area, uh, AFC FTA. Um, the question goes: Do you think the recent creation of of AFCTA <laughs> will be a game changer for, for African development. Yeah, the, so it just opened up, it became fully operational on January 1st this year. Uh, it's the largest free trade area in the world, but in terms of countries, 54 out of 55 African countries uh, are members. Tell us about it and, and what effect is it going to have on development of, of the continent? Uh, well, I think it has a huge potential, but uh, it must be faced with uh, a very cautious optimism because, as you mentioned, it's something that is no longer just an intention. It's something that has entered into force. It is a very big trade area in terms of the number of countries, the combined GDP and the combined population. It has a very significant growth potential if we think that right now only around 17% of the African exports are intra-regional. And it has clear goals, which is always important to make sure that things uh, actually happen, namely to eliminate 97% of the existing tariffs in the next 10 to 13 years. Uh, and of course, this may be a game changer, especially for those economies that are anchor economies that already play a relevant role in the sub-regional and regional uh, at the sub-regional and regional level, and to accelerate growth in, in key sectors like agro-industry, uh, the pharmaceutical sector, even in terms of the potential of e-commerce, they have a standardization protocol planned for the phase three of the agreement. However, there are significant obstacles. Uh, and, and two of the more relevant, I would say, the, the first one is that there are countries that are still resisting this idea not least Nigeria. Nigeria has recently and finally ratified the agreement, but the truth is that President Buhari has very strong protectionist instincts and the country has been implementing more restrictive trade policies. And the second challenge has to do uh, with all the trans-border tensions and conflicts that are going on. And of course, that reduces trust and, 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 and it, it, it contributes to a very uncertain and volatile environment that affects investment and trade. Uh, and these tensions, and we can think, for example, about tensions in the border between Senegal and Gambia. We can think about tensions because of the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam between Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan the effects of terrorism, uh, this compromises the spirit of the free circulation of goods, services, and, and people. So I think it's, it's a mixed picture. Absolutely. Uh, well, with that, we are at the end of our time uh, for today. However, I really found this an excellent discussion. Teresa, thank you so much uh, for, sure. for uh, allowing us uh, a little bit of your time uh, to, to go over uh, these very important issues and to give us some of this insight, which, which I found fascinating. I, I know that our, our audience did as well. I want to thank our audience for, for participating, for asking your questions. I'm really sorry I didn't get to all of the questions that I saw in the q and I didn't get to every hand that was there, um, but this leaves us more to talk about in the future, which I hope that we will be able to do. Um, and with that, I do want to tell our audience that um, the next uh, GIS webinar, 
is scheduled for May 12th. So mark your calendars. Uh, do look out on social media and your emails wherever you were able to, to get this information, this uh, the invitation to this webinar from. Uh, keep an eye out and, and be ready. Mark your calendars for May 12th, where we're going to talk about the very interesting issue of Taiwan. Um, so we'll be joined by Junhua Zhang, uh, our uh, Chinese expert at uh, Geopolitical Intelligence Services. So please do uh, uh, join us for that. Uh, and with that said, uh, I want to thank you all once again. I'll thank Teresa one more time. Teresa, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I wish you all a great day. Thank you for joining us. See you on May 12th. Goodbye.